Wonderful to be here. How are you doing this morning? Doing well? Oh, very nice. This is my uh, fifth year uh, coming here to Bengaluru, and uh, I, ju I just love it. Every morning, uh, I fill my plate full of uh, puri and sambar and vadu and all the good things I can't get in the United States. Um, I save up my cheeseburgers and french fries when I go back home. Uh, so I am really excited to kick off the conference for you. But a quick question. How many of you, is this your first time coming to the conference? Oh, look at that. That's wonderful. Give them a round of applause. It's so nice having you here. How many are you seasoned veterans? How many of you have been here several times before? Thank you so much. It's good seeing you again. I recognize all of you, each one of you individually. Yeah, yeah. So to kick things off, I want to talk to all the young developers in the audience. And here's a hint. We're all young developers. At one point in our careers, we are young developers, but all throughout our career. We're young developers as well. There we go. There we go. This is how um, most of my professional colleagues know me. As an author, as an instructor, as a, as a software developer. Uh, written a number of books, spent a lot of years, spent over 20 years in this industry doing web development in a variety of different languages on a variety of different platforms. But this is how my kids know me. Not as an author, not as a programmer, but as a dad with an iPad. We have lots of iPads in the house. Lots of iPhones, lots of computers, lots of laptops. This is my son, Christopher, who's 12, and my daughter, Libby, who is 8. And adults, parents, always have advice for their kids. Don't play in the street. Don't eat dirt, you'll die. Good things like that, right? Um, this is my parental wisdom to my kids. I tell them that right now is the time they need to learn how to tell their computers what to do. Because if they don't learn how to do that now, they'll spend the rest of their lives being told what to do by their computer. No one wants that, do they? They have two options in their future. Their computer could be a faithful companion telling them what to do, helping them as they go along. Or it could be a much darker future, couldn't it? But the option is theirs. Now this keynote especially is interesting to me because my son is a rabid Minecraft fan. Have any of you played Minecraft before? Are any of you familiar with this game? Oh, come on, I love this game. I play it quite a bit. Minecraft is a game written in Java. But it is not a game where you keep score. There are no high scores. It just goes on and on and on. And it's a building game. When you get dropped into the world, you don't have clothing. You don't have a house. You don't have food to eat. So the first thing you have to do is build up a mud hut. And then once you start chopping down trees, you can start building wooden tools, wooden axes that will make it easier for you to chop down trees so you can build a wooden house. You can also build a wooden pickaxe so you can start mining stone and build a stone house. And so you see it's a very creative endeavor. It's a game that's built on the idea that you need to build your own world. You need to create your own reality. But what's really nice about this game is not only is that how the game is played, Minecraft, written in Java, is an incredibly extensible game. People are writing mods, modifications of this game, and rapidly training, trading games. My son loves to play Pokemon. And so there is a mod for Minecraft that brings all the Pokemon characters into the game. There are also mods that bring Star Wars characters into the game. There are mods that give you different capabilities. So this is a class that I am going to be teaching in just a couple of weeks in Denver for DevOps for Kids, an organization that is trying to bring programming to kids at a younger and younger age. This class is open for kids as young as 10 years old. 
up through high school students. And we're going to teach them not only to play the game, but how to write their own extensions to the game, how to do Java programming as a 10-year-old. Wish me luck. It's going to be an interesting class to teach. But as I was preparing for this class, I realized that this isn't going to be a typical class. This isn't going to be a class where I can just throw syntax at the young kids and they should know how to go. I need to teach them how to program. And not just specifically in Minecraft. I need to let them know that this is a springboard for future. So as I was putting together this class, I started thinking to myself, well, how did I learn my first language? And then I said, well, how have I learned every subsequent language since then? How do I learn a new web framework? How do I learn a new library, a new API? And so as I was putting together this course material for 10-year-olds on how to do Java programming, this is what very quick, quickly came to mind, is that every time I sit down to learn something new, a new language, a new framework, a new library, I always go through the same three steps. I have to teach myself how to type all over again. Then I need to teach myself how to think. And then I need to teach myself how to predict the future. That's not too terrible, is it? It's simple, right? Well, let's discuss these things. Let's first talk about how you learn to type. How many of you spend all day in your IDE? You never leave your IDE. You launch it first thing in the morning and never go, yeah. Yeah, that's what I expected. Some of you were shy, but you, you, you began to tell me the truth. You can't lie to me. I know. I know. GUIs are wonderful if you're brand new. But GUIs can end up being training wheels. If you rely on the GUI and never learn how to type, never learn how to get out to the command line, never learn how to do Java programming without control space, autocomplete, you're going to be in a world of hurt, aren't you, when your IDE lets you down, when there isn't a menu option to show you what to do, when there isn't a keystroke. My dear friend, Dr. Subramaniam, does Java programming in a text editor. It's incredibly impressive. But what you end up finding is as you get good, that training wheels that helped you as a new programmer eventually slow you down and get in the way. Ultimately, the keyboard will always, always be faster than the mouse. So I'm not saying we should never use a GUI. We all need to get started. But we need to very quickly understand what's going on behind those menu options, behind the GUI. A wise friend of mine, Glenn Vandenberg, once said, it's important for developers to always understand one layer of abstraction below where they do your day-to-day -day work. So if your day-to-day -day work is in an IDE, you owe it to yourself. You need to understand one layer of abstraction below, what's going on at the command line, so you aren't tied by your tools. Now, this manifests in a number of different ways. My kids have lots of games loaded up on their iPhones and their iPads. And one of the things they realized is that if they have seven or eight screens of games they need to get through, it's actually much quicker to drag down on the screen and begin typing. So the front page of your phone is meant for just that, your quick icons, so you can tap and away you go. But anything that you don't use on a daily basis, you probably find that it's quicker to slide and search rather than swipe and tap. And that's true not only on your phones, it's true on your desktop as well. I was never so proud when I saw my five-year-old daughter sitting at a computer, and she put a DVD in the side, and she hit Apple Spacebar and typed in DVD. A five-year-old girl found that typing was faster than looking for the icon to double-click on. And my wife said, I don't have any idea how she learned how to do that. We didn't teach her that. 
but she's watching us. Children are always seeing what you're doing. And so how many times have you reached over your children's shoulders and say, here, let me launch this DVD player for you real quick, and then go about other things? She's paying attention. She learned those things. Apple Space DVD is fastest for her. That is the way she thinks now. I've done my job well, haven't I? Yeah. In a fair fight, the keyboard will always, always, always win. So what does this mean to us as web developers? So many times, I need to launch a new website. I need to experiment with something. So I end up doing something like this. I'll end up making a new directory. Here we go. I'll make a new Gibbs directory. We can see there's nothing going on in there at all. I'll need to touch a quick file. I'll need to pull it up in a text editor. And very quickly, I'll need to come in here and begin. You can see my typing is the slowest part of this exercise. But very quickly, in that amount of time, I need to be able to come in here and pull up a website. Are you able to spin up a new project that quickly? And it doesn't matter what language. Java, Ruby, Clojure, Scala. You need to have that level of fluidity, not file, new, project, import, jars, what version of Java are you using, what web server are you going to be using, all the, ooh, yeah, the thing, you know, seven more uh, things. You need to be able to get up and running that quickly. Now, granted, that was just a simple text-based website. I spent a lot of time in Grails. And I got to tell you that spinning up a new Grails website is just as quickly. You type in Grails create app and it scaffolds out all the directories for you. You go in and if you need to create a new, uh, a new domain class, I can come in here right now and I can say Grails create domain class book. And what this is doing in just that amount of time, it's not only creating the class for me, it's going to be creating the underlying database tables for me as well. Being able to come in here and say Grails create scaffold controller, test to book, will then bring in the rest of that app that I need. Once again, let's pull it up in a text editor. We can see that I now have a book controller that's going to do everything I need it to do. I have a domain class in here that's going to do everything I need it to do. So I can come in here and say string author, string title. You can see that that scaffolding not only created the domain classes, it also created my unit tests. Because you all are unit testing, right? Nod your head yes, even if you aren't. Yes, Scott, we're all writing unit tests. All right? So in that amount of time, and being able to now come in and do a Grails run app, I'm going to have a fully formed Grails application up and running. You can see what the scaffolding allows me to do. It allows me to focus on the business problems I'm trying to solve, not the mundane things about, well, what should I name this directory, and where should I put the jars, and where should I put the CSS and the JavaScript. That is not the exciting part of our job. That is not the interesting part of the job. That's not the most important part of our job. That is the least important part of our job. So what we need to do is to be able to scaffold that away so we aren't wasting our time on unnecessary busy work. And there's a whole new wave of software out there that's trying to make it easy for you to do these kinds of things from the command line. I'm going to be giving a presentation on this later today, a presentation on a JavaScript framework called Yeoman. Have any of you worked with Yeoman right now? Your hands go way up. Isn't it a wonderful framework? Yeah. It is allowing you to do exactly what I just did, scaffold out things at the command line. And what's wonderful about this are there are a number of different generators out there. So my slideware that I use is an is a HTML5, uh, HTML5 slide framework called Reveal.js 
This is what the, I'm giving this presentation in right now. I'll also be giving a talk on HTML5 sli slides later today. But when it comes time for me to build out a new presentation, I'll go in, I'll make a directory, I'll say, yo, reveal. That's yeoman in action right there. It'll scaffold it out. Then I'll type in slide init, SL init. That's a script that I wrote to put my boilerplate stuff in place. But then most importantly, as I come in here, let me show you here. So here's my presentation right now. What you can end up doing from the command line is not only running this server with a couple of slides in it, I can just as easily come in here and say slide third, slide fourth, slide gids. And we can see I don't even have to bounce my server. I get third, fourth, and gids as I go along in there. So over and over and over again, what you'll find is being able to type those things out quickly, not having to say file, new, slide, using this template. Being able to type as quickly as you can type from the command line will speed you to what you're supposed to be doing, which is solving real business problems, not fumbling around with the mouse and menus and GUIs. Because typing isn't the end. Typing is the beginning. Because if you can't type it, you can't script it away. How do you script up menu clicks? How do you script up button clicks? You can't. But eventually, you want to be able to build up entire workflows. I want to be able to check out a project, pull down all the dependencies, initialize a database, and then push it into production. All of that requires you to be able to type it, because if you can't type it, you can't script it. I have scads of aliases set up. Now, I'm on OS X, so I use a file called bash profile. But you'll find that you can use that in uh, Windows as well through simple batch files. So rather than typing ls-al to get at these kinds of things, I've got that mapped to ll. Instead of typing in clear to do these kinds of things, I've got it just mapped to C. So you will see that there are so many different shortcuts that you can use to speed your way along at the command line. I've got S alias to sublime. I've got M text mapped to TextMate. So now at the command line, I've got these very short commands that I am able to use to launch all of the apps that I need on a regular basis. Now, sometimes you can't just script it away in a single line like this. Sometimes you need to do things a little bit more. So what I've done is I've created a bin directory right in my home directory as well that allows me to deal with longer commands. Over here, did you notice, let's see, where are we at? There we go. Let me move up one. Do you remember this uh, index file here? This command that I typed in web to launch a web browser like that? In fact, all that is is this one liner. I have Python loaded on my system. It comes pre-installed, so I don't have to do a thing. I can launch a very simple web server, and then that $1 allows me to specify a port. So I can launch one web server on port 7,000, another on 8,000, another on 9,000. It's little things like that that speed your day. How quickly you're able to spin up a new web server or refresh your data in your database or set up new code for you to begin programming. Typing and scripting and aliasing. You can alias in git as well. Rather than typing in git status, you can set up aliases. So you can type in git s. Instead of git branch, you can set up an alias. So you can type in git b. So there are all kinds of things you can do, but here's where it gets interesting. One of the reasons I favor text editors like TextMate 
and sublime and things like that, or I'm able to create my own aliases. I don't spend my time learning Eclipse keyboard shortcuts. I write my own keyboard shortcuts. So I don't know if you've noticed that when I came in here to spin up that uh, uh, that new website, I was able to do very quick things like type in P and tab to get a paragraph, or div and tab to get a div, or even A to get an anchor href. Little things like that. Those are all things that that I was able to install, but I can also go in and begin creating my own shortcuts so that when I want to do something silly like foo, I've got that available to me as well. So finding tools that support the scripting, not just at the command line, but text editors, IDEs, that level of customization is crucial. Every Jedi should be able to create her own lightsaber. And as a developer, this is what you do. You should be deeply, deeply, deeply customizing your environment. Anything you can do to speed your way. So what does this have to do with teaching kids how to program? Am I going to teach them all of those different command line shortcuts and things like that? No, no, I'm not going to do that. That's not appropriate for a 10-year-old. That's appropriate for 30 and 40-year-olds. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to do the ubiquitous hello world. Quick question for you. Who wrote the first hello world example? Where did that example come to life? Do you know? Can you tell by the language that we're showing up on the screen here? Yeah, see, absolutely. The first Kernahan and Ritchie book, the first K&R book, the C book released in 1974. And what made that example so incredibly powerful is because they said this is the bare minimum you need to type in to make sure that your environment is set up correctly. It makes sure that you can compile it and link it and run it. We're not trying to do something extraordinary. We're trying to do the simplest thing to make sure that everything works. And you know what we figured out through all of this? That success breeds success. How many times have you downloaded a new web framework or library and struggled to get even the simplest example up and running? How much time did you spend on it? 10 minutes? 30 minutes? A day? If you kept struggling and weren't able to do it, what do you eventually do? Kick it to the curb, right? So being able to get up and running as quickly as possible, that's why in Grails it's so nice being able to type in Grails create app. I can type Grails run app right there. I haven't even created a single domain class, but I know that the framework will come up and begin serving web pages. That quick success breeds confidence. It lets you think that, oh, I know how to do this. I can now go on and begin doing the interesting bits. So here's where we're going to start with our Minecraft class. Yeah, unfortunately, there are a few more lines involved than Kernahan and Ritchie's Hello World. But what we're going to do here, and I know this is fairly small, but you've got methods like on load, on enable, on disable, on command. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up a command so when they launch Minecraft, they'll be able to go in through their chat window and say slash hello and see hello world come back at them. That very quick hello world is something that we can do. We'll not make them type in all of this boilerplate. We'll give them the boilerplate and allow them to inject just the message that they want to show up. But at 10 years old, being able to have that very first message come up and be able to launch the web server and have them writing their first plugin within the first two minutes of class is going to give them the confidence to say, I can be a programmer. I can go up and do these kinds of things. And what I'm especially excited about are not the little 10-year-old boys that are in class, but the 10-year-old girls that are in class. I don't think for a moment that women are intrinsically less able to be programmers. I would argue maybe the opposite. They're wiser than us men, aren't they? 
They know a lot of what's going on. But young girls have so much stacked up against them. Oh, you're not good at math. You're not good at science. Why don't you go off here and play with your dollies? That this success that we can give young girls in the first two minutes of class, I hope, opens up a whole generation of women software developers who realize how quickly and how easily they can become a programmer. That is what DevOps is all about, DevOps for kids. But more importantly, the minute they do this, we're going to have a set of Gradle scripts for them. We're going to script away the uninteresting bits. They can go and look at the scripts and understand the scripts and learn what those scripts are doing. But the important thing for us is to be able to script that stuff away so they can very easily create a new server plugin, very quickly apply it to their server, and very quickly launch their server as well. These kids are going to be out of the command line right at the beginning. It's that important. So when it comes to learning type, we have to realize that in a fair fight, a keyboard will always beat a mouse. And we have to also realize that if you can't type it, you can't script it away. And if you can't script it away, you have no hope of achieving the developer velocity you need to be successful. So learning to type. Well, once you know how to type, you need to learn how to think. Because if it's not running, you're going to spend all of your mental power saying, why is it running? What have I done wrong? What did I don't have in place? What path is missing? What DLL is not installed? But once it is running, you can start focusing on why it's running. And that's where the interesting stuff comes in. Because so many people start their careers thinking, Programming is all about learning syntax. That's the least interesting part of our job, isn't it? How many of you think you've learned your last programming language? How many of you think that the language you know right now is the last one you're ever going to learn? Yeah. Either one or two things will happen. Either it'll be a very short career, or even worse, it'll be an incredibly long, boring dull, unfulfilling career. We thrive on change. The syntax, that's an implementation detail. At university, I learned COBOL and Pascal. How much COBOL do you think I'm writing these days? All right? The important thing, though, is the thinking, learning how to be a programmer. Because the first programming language you learn is hard. The second one is easier. The third one is easier. And it gets to the point where it's almost trivial learning these kinds of things, if you know how to think. My dad retired from IBM. He carried a ThinkPad around with him, even back in the 1960s. Not the laptop, of course. Right? A pad of paper. IBM's motto was think. What a wonderful motto for a computer company. And of course, years later, it's what allowed Apple to say think different. My dad retired from IBM. I'm much more of a think different kind of guy, aren't I? Yeah, I don't think IBM would allow me with a haircut like this. But when did this become what we do as developers? What does this have to do with Thinking. Nothing. All right, you haven't lied to me so far. How many of you have code in production that you don't understand? Come on, yeah, yeah, exactly. How much of that code do you reckon was copy and pasted from somewhere else? Uh huh, yep. Copy and paste is the cancer of our industry. Because there is no thinking involved. There is no learning involved in that. Have you heard of something called kinesthetic learning? There are many different learning styles. Some people are visual learners. They like reading things. Some people are all learners. They like hearing things explained. But as programmers, the only way we really learn how to code is by typing, by laying our fingers on the keyboard, kinesthetic. And study after study proves that Literally, different things are going on biologically in your brain when you see them, when you hear them, and when you type them. Ideally, what you want to do is get all three of those 
to really lock the concepts in. If you think about it, code that you've copied and pasted and it runs, it's ephemeral, isn't it? It disappears. You have no recollection of even copying and pasting the code in. But code that you've typed and it didn't run, so you retyped it, you fixed your syntax errors, it maybe took you several minutes instead of several seconds, but that code that you typed is locked in. You won't make the same syntax error a second time. You will understand what that code is doing. You're the one who put the code in place to run it. Kinesthetic learning is a really, really important aspect of our industry. This is why typing is so much more important than copy and pasting, because it involves thinking. Remember earlier when I said rookie programmers think programming is all about syntax? Well, it explains a lot. I am shocked when I come into new organizations how little the programmers tend to know about their domain. I'm working with clients right now in pharmaceuticals. Now, I don't expect them to be able to mix up the drugs, but as a programmer who's been working in the pharmaceutical industry, you need to be able to explain that domain to me in an easy way. I've got another client right now that's doing video on demand ad insertions. So inserting commercials into video on demand kind of things. They have a whole different vocabulary, don't they, to explain video on demand and commercials than my pharmaceutical companies, than my oil and gas companies, than my educational institutions. All of them are sharing the same syntax, probably grails, maybe backbone, certainly HTML5. The syntax is the least interesting part of their jobs. They should be focusing all of their energy on learning the domain. Have you seen this floating around the internet? The fine print is a little bit uh, small there. Vegetarian ham, chicken flavored. What? <laughs> This is clearly put together by a programmer who didn't understand their domain at all, right? Yeah, yeah. So a real code smell is when you come into an organization and you see customer one equals new customer. Item one equals new item, new item, new item. How could anyone learn about their domain based on these silly little examples? These are next to worthless examples, aren't they? They demonstrate zero understanding of the domain. This is purely an exercise in syntax. And you know what? Why should you care about syntax? Let your compiler worry about syntax. You should be focusing on understanding the domain. And once you understand the domain, you can start th saying things like, oh, my customer's name is Cindy Customer. Do you see how even with that, I have the idea of a first name and a last name? Maybe I want to say, hello, Ms. Customer. How are you doing? I've got gender I need to deal with. Oh, look, Cindy is from Colorado. She's from the United States. We begin thinking about sales tax. We end up thinking about shipping. We end up thinking about optimizing what warehouse these items are going to come from. Instead of item one, item two, item three, if I have a monitor and an HDMI cable and an extended warranty, you start thinking to yourselves, oh, I've got some very inexpensive items and some very big expensive items. What of these items need to be taxed? What are exempt from taxes? Can you buy an extended warranty on a monitor? I hope so. Can you buy it on a cable? Maybe not. You can see by applying just a little bit of domain knowledge, this becomes an infinitely more interesting problem than customer one, item one. If you're writing code like that, take the extra time to focus on the domain, because that's a hallmark of a mature developer, not a young developer. So much so that I've uh, really come to appreciate this book. I've known about it for years and read about it, but more and more organizations could spend some quality time with this book, Domain Driven Design. There are a number of different books out there, but this is the K&R of DDD. This is written by Eric Evans. But Domain Driven Design says, don't worry about the syntax. Focus on the domain. Focus on your core classes. Focus on the interactions between those classes, items and shopping carts and sales tax and shipping and things like that. That's the important part, not curly braces and semicolons. What does this have to do with Minecraft? 
Well, there are a couple of Minecraft books out on the market and ostensibly targeted at kids. But they start with, you're going to be using Java. Let me explain Java to you. All right, now Java is object oriented. Let me explain classes to you. You'll find some interfaces. Let me explain what an interface is. Oftentimes, you're 100 pages into the book before you've written your first plugin. I was bored. I can't imagine what a 10-year-old is going to do. I'm sure it's going to get good, Dad. I'm on page 99. I'll bet you page 100 is going to be better. Right? With kids and with grown-ups, focusing on syntax is not what we should be focusing on. We're going to be using an API called Bucket. I love it. B-U-K-K-I-T dot org. But the examples we're going to use are examples like this. This is probably the second or third example we're going to have them type in. Players, inventory, inventory item. Because you know what? That is what the 10-year-olds know. They've been playing the game. They understand players. They understand inventory and inventory items. We're going to be focusing on the domain and let the syntax happen organically. If you focus on the domain, your job is infinitely more interesting than objects and interfaces and primitives. So coding is thinking. Because coding is all about domain objects. The syntax you're using today is not what you're going to use tomorrow and certainly not what you're going to use 20 years from now. The language is an implementation detail. Are you more interested in the chisel or the statue? And as programmers, we often spend too much time fetishizing our chisels instead of appreciating the art that we create. So once you've learned how to type and once you've learned how to think, the last thing you have to do is learn how to predict the future. Now, I saw your reactions. I said, okay, you need to learn how to type. And you said, okay, Scott, I'll type. I get it. Yeah. And then I said, you learn how to think. And that made a lot of people angry. I apologize for making you angry. You are going to have to think in this career. Yes? But predicting the future? How ridiculous is that? How can you possibly do something like that? Wayne Gretzky did. Oftentimes considered, considered the best hockey player in the world. He's retired now. Hockey is a lot like cricket, right? Except it's on ice and the players get to punch each other. Do you get to punch each other in cricket? No, no, okay. So then, then, then they're very different sports, yeah? Yeah. Maybe that would improve cricket. I don't know. I mean, who knows? Um, but this is his famous quote. He says that I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it's been. As programmers, that's what we need to do as well. We need to skate to where the puck is going to be. That's what I mean by predicting the future. So how do you define experience? This is a talk targeted at young developers. How do you define experience? So many times it's based on what? Seniority. How long you've been in the job, right? Well, and there is some merit to this. This is a very nice book. If any of you read this, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. It's a very good book, isn't it? Yeah. Now, I'm not going to give it justice in just a few minutes, but he says essentially in order to become an expert, you have to spend 10,000 hours doing something. And I know that sounds very trite and very simplistic. He actually spends 500 pages going into details, detailing successful people, young people, old people, historic figures, nobody's like me. Right? But over and over again, he says, based on what I've observed, it seems that about 10,000 hours is what it takes to become an expert in a given endeavor, whether it's playing the piano or playing basketball or being a writer or being a programmer. Now, if you do the math, 10,000 hours, all right, 40-hour work week, that's about 250 weeks, all right, 52 weeks in a year, all right. So, in just about five years, you can expect to be an expert. Now, I can see what many of you are thinking. Some of you are saying, oh, that's way too long. I can learn an API in a day, right? Would you consider yourself an expert? What are you learning in a day? Syntax or thinking? 
Yeah, syntax is easy, isn't it? We can learn syntax. Yeah, but what do you get by spending five years with a language or a framework? You learn the ins and the outs, don't you? You know what it's good at, you know what it's not good at. Does using Word for five years make you a great author? No. Does using Eclipse for five years make you a great programmer? Maybe the opposite. No, that's not fair, and of course not. No, but you get the idea here is that simple chronology is not what we should be focusing on. I tell people when I'm explaining my hourly rate, I say it's based on the number of years I've been in the industry times the number of mistakes I've made over my career. That's how I get to my hourly rate as a contractor. Yeah? Because the mistakes are what experience really is, isn't it? You find the mistake of making every database table a string, right? You find the mistake of trying to put 10,000 or 10 million records in a database without an index. You make these mistakes, and over time, that's what makes you a good programmer. I tell young programmers that every time a unit test fails, another angel gets her wings, right? Because that's one more mistake that you've made, that you've trapped, that you won't make again. My math here doesn't count the same mistake that I make over and over again. I should have clarified that early, right? You can't be in the industry for 20 years and make the same mistake over and over and over again for 20 years and be considered a good programmer. You need to make great, grandiose, brand new mistakes every day of your life in order to be a good, experienced programmer. And so when people bring me into my organization, I say, you're not bringing me in for my expertise. You're making fun of me because I've made way more mistakes than you have. I've made mistakes you wouldn't have even dreamed of making. That's why you're paying me so much money. I'm the biggest idiot in your organization. Yeah? And they think that they're bringing me in to help them plan things out, that I can see the future, that seeing the future means planning it out to the nth degree. No, seeing the future isn't planning. Seeing the future is reacting. Being quick on your feet or quick on your skates, as the case may be. Do you think that Mr. Gretzky plans out an entire hockey game? Okay, now the puck is going to go here first, and I'm going to skate here, and then it's going to go here. No, it's all happening in real time right there. But being able to react and skate to where the puck is going to be is what makes him an experienced skater. He's been skating for longer than 10,000 hours. He's been skating for years, but he's made all those mistakes, and every mistake that he makes makes him a better a hockey player. He's arguably made more mistakes than anyone else on the ice, and that's what makes him an expert. Here's another way of looking at this. Malcolm X said, education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. And by preparing for it today, it means making those mistakes. Make them now so that you can begin building up that expertise. So what am I telling these DevOps kids to make lots of mistakes? Absolutely I am. There is no better place to make programming mistakes than in a classroom with a teacher when you're 10 years old. Because if you can begin making mistakes at 10 that I didn't make until I was in my 20s or 30s, Think about the head start they're going to have on me. I've got 20 years in the industry. What if they have 20 years of experience before they graduate from university? Who's the expert then? Yeah? So I'm going to leave you with what I started with. It's very important for you to learn how to tell your computer what to do. Otherwise, you're going to be bossed around by it for the rest of your life. And that's no life, is it at all? So once you learn how to type, once you learn how to think, once you learn how to predict the future, you can consider yourself to be a seasoned, experienced programmer as well. And that is my advice to young developers. Did you enjoy yourself? 
I did as well. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, uh, Scott. One more big round of applause to him for that wonderful start.